Hey guys, I just finished a great conversation from my podcast channel with a new friend of mine called Glow at Hanmore. Glow is an online educator, she is an author, and she is a travel blogger, a serial entrepreneur, and she has a very distinct, clear, important voice into the whole question of racism right now that we are battling with all over the world. She has had articles featured in Oprah's Magazine, Forbes Magazine, uh, Condé Nast, BuzzFeed, and others. She is a fantastic human being. You're going to love this interview. Don't forget to comment and subscribe to my podcast channel. Thank you. Before you get started on today's podcast with Paul Scanlon, we just wanted to let you know that he now has a free course available to you. If you head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course, you'll be able to sign up to his video series called The Five Behaviors of Successful People. We hope that this course adds value to your life. Now enjoy the podcast. Well, listen, it's great to have you on the show. I wanted to ask you a bit about, um, I suppose, your background and journey. I want people to know uh, your origins and a little bit of the journey to to, to the glow that you are now. And by the way, when when did someone first shorten your name to glow? In childhood? Ah, it's such a good question. Um, funny story, G Money was my first nickname. So G Money? <laughs> I, I was an entrepreneur through and through. I was selling uh, pop, yeah. pop trucks in kindergarten and airheads and, and mixed CDs in middle school. So I think G Money was like, oh, she's getting her money. <laughs> but Glow came about, I think, in high school. It was just like there was Glow Stick and then eventually it was Glow. So <laughs> I am a prolific name shortener. So you would have been Glow to me from day one. <laughs> or even G might be even better. I call my assistant Hannah H. I'm always short. <laughs> glow works. That's great. So <laughs> Tell me a bit about your background, where you were born, raised, and a little bit about your evolution from childhood. Yeah, so born and raised in the Bay Area. It's just outside of San Francisco. It's called oh. Bay Bird. Um, both my parents were born and raised in Nigeria. I'm one of six kids. So they had my oldest sister in Nigeria and then the rest of the five kids in California. Um, grew up never really fitting in. I think when you're a middle child anyway, and you're an Aries, you want to rebel, you want to be independent, you want to find your space. And I think for most of my childhood, I was just kind of like, I don't belong. And I was so angry because I knew I didn't belong and I didn't understand what my role in this world would be. And I would see kids, cause you know, we didn't grow up with much. So I would see kids, you know, th there's the haves and the have nots immediately as, you know, a child, you're, you, you're in public school and you can, see the division of the haves and the have-nots and belonging in the have-nots was it, it it did a lot to me it motivated me and it had me have like this chip on my shoulder like ah you know they have all of this stuff but they're really rude people and they're mean and they're bullies and I'm like why do they deserve this life and I would just always ask myself these hard questions of like how can I get there but still maintain like my integrity and still have character and I wow. found my <laughs> I found myself staying after class and just hanging with my teachers. And I remember, I think that's why I kind of have like an old soul as my, as my friends would say is just m my closest friends were teachers. Like I couldn't relate to my peers. And it was when I was 11 years old, Mr. Miranda, it was career day. He made a bunch of flashcards and it had all the typical careers, firefighter, police officer, teacher, librarian, you know, and he's like, okay, everyone come to the front of the desk, pick your flashcard of your career, you know, and let's just, you know, talk about it. So everyone rushes and like immediately like, oh, lawyer, doctor, everyone was so like, mind you, at 11 years old, everyone was so solid about what they were going to do. Right. I get to the desk and I'm like, okay waiting for my heart to skip a beat waiting for that moment where I would just know by looking at the word and I'm like on my fourth round of like looking at all the cards and I'm like this is pathetic are these really all the options <laughs> and again being a little bit of a rebel I just didn't pick a card I've never been one to settle so I went back to my desk without a card because I didn't figure there would be a consequence little did I know you know my my last name starts with an a I would be the first to be called to read out what my career would be and what I'd pick on the card. 
And, you know, I tell Mr. Miranda, I, I didn't pick a card. I didn't pick a card. Why not? I'm like, I don't like any of the options. And I can, <laughs> I can remember as if it were yesterday, all of my classmates, because I always sat in the back, <laughs> all of my classmates were like, ooh, you know, that snicker as if like, oh, glow's in trouble again. <laughs> But he told me stay after class. And so I was like, whatever, you know. And I stay after class and Mr. Miranda tells me, go home and look up the word entrepreneur. I think that's what you're gonna be. Wow. 11 years old. And I think teachers have such immense power, the ability yep. to pour into people at such a young age and not, you know, he could have easily, you know, criticized or condemned me for not choosing what, you know, the options. So I really, you know, appreciate that he said, okay, I can recognize there's something different about this one. Let me go ahead and feed her spirit with what that actual, actual uh, career path could look like. So I just became obsessed with the word entrepreneur. I was like, whoa, like just even in the spelling of the word, I'm like, oh, this is different spelled. Like this is just such a complex spelling. I love it. <laughs> um, since then, I kind of like have just been an entrepreneur. <laughs> so had you not heard the word till then? No, no, I, I never wow. even knew it was a possibility. I wow. always, I, and because you don't see it, like my, everything that you see on TV, the, the media, your direct influences, everyone has a very cookie cutter path. So you don't even know the entrepreneurial world exists because you're not shown it in any way. So when you first said that word entrepreneur and understood what it meant, did you instantly feel it described you? Yeah, oh, I, I just, I, I liked, I, I felt this sense of freedom. I was like, whoa, it was like the sense of freedom and a sense of relief, knowing that entrepreneurs can create their own business and create their own path. I, I've always been a creator, like through and through. So just seeing the word create and seeing the world, the, the word freedom and just learning and studying what you know because back then i don't even think we had computers i had to look it up in like an encyclopedia <laughs> it was just like whoa and so i'm just like diving deep into like what does entrepreneurship mean and you know who, who, who's a good example of an entrepreneur so it was, it was a really cool um thing to be exposed to at 11 years old how did it affect you from 11 onwards then i'm thinking you know, most kids, as you say, they get some kind of end goal in mind in terms of a role or a job, then kind of think, I've got to get these qualifications, these exams, go to this college. So your entrepreneurial thinking would free you to a degree from that. So did it change the way you did school and life after you, that occurred to you that was you? Definitely. I think... At the end of the day, especially as a kid, we all just want a sense of belonging and community and defining our human existence, like what is my part in this world? So having that entrepreneur label to fall back on kind of gave me a sense of comfort because I knew I was different and my different, me being different isolated me in a lot of ways. And, you know, I, I became so angry for being so different. But once I had that entrepreneur title to look forward to, I was like, okay, I'm different because I'm an entrepreneur, because I'm an entrepreneur. I do this because I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> did you tell your parents? How did they respond to that word? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, I barely told my mom I changed my degree 10 days before I graduated because wow. I still went through to be a pre-med major in college. Because when you have, you know, when you're a first generation immigrant or first generation American, you have that just the weight and the pressure of the world on you from your parents to say, I brought you all the way to America. Like I've given you everything. The, the oh. least you can do is give me a, a doctorate degree, a, a lawyer wow. degree, you know, and they, they have a really, <laughs> I'll say impressive way of, emotional manipulation and i say this with a lot of love because i can see the context of why they want you to, to to do so well and work so hard for those two labels because in their generation during their time growing up there was no other way to make it outside of being a doctor lawyer right. engineer you know otherwise you're a disappointment so when I, when that pressure just built up and I would see my mom struggle and you know my dad got deported when I was 11 and here she was working two jobs as a nurse to raise six kids you you take that pressure in I'm an empath as well so I'm like oh whatever I can do to alleviate her pain and, and to make life easier for her 
So I just kind of like my entrepreneurial, I guess, paths and, and, and journey was kind of like always like a secret. Like I would burn mixtapes um, during the LimeWire, FrostWire era. I don't know if you remember those websites. I would like illegally pirate music. <laughs> I don't know if the government can still come for me. It's been so many years. <laughs> but I think I, the things on their mind right now. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, I just found, I, I would always, I was really good at supply and demand. So again, I mentioned as a kindergartner, I sold cough drops in kindergarten. Like I was sick one day. I, I brought cough drops to school because I was sick. And I saw people, you know, when we're, we're kindergartners, you see like a little red, you know, thing it looks like candy so everyone is like oh I want one glow I want one well they weren't calling me glow but I want one I want one and so I'm like ooh, if I bring the whole pack of cough drops the next day and sell it for a quarter I could probably turn over 10 bucks so I did that and of course I got caught like <laughs> there were like parents that wrote reports on me <laughs> it was so bad. are you still alive sorry are your parents still alive? Yeah, my mom's alive. My dad passed when I was 23 in a diabetic coma. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because I saw you posting about flying your family to Maldives at some time in the future. Yeah. So whatever happens, they'll be glad that you decided to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> oh, definitely. No, and, and they're so supportive now. I think it's really hard to understand someone's entrepreneurial journey when right. all you see is their struggle. Like, totally. you know, I was very open about like not eating and just like, I was missing a lot of meals for my first two to three years of building my brand, but I was honestly willing to struggle in another country to create content and build up, yeah, build up that education and the, and the travel, uh, the travel savvy that I knew would help me get to the next level rather than, you know, give my mom the satisfaction of, of knowing that I, I couldn't make this work. And, and for me, that's what I love about entrepreneurs is it, we're, we're so stubborn and it's like we're, we're equally motivated by our doubters as much as our supporters <laughs> yeah what was the teacher's name again mr miranda mr miranda well we need to give him a shout out do you still have contact with him you know what's crazy is on facebook i tried to reach out to him like 10 years ago and he's not on facebook i don't remember his first name I contacted the elementary school. There's no record. And I'm just like, and maybe it's one of those. Yeah, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can like get like an actual investigator to track him down. But now that feels a little creepy. But, you know, I've shouted him out in my book. You know, I, I've definitely been preaching his name. And I hope one day he hears about how much he's affected my life. Yeah, because I wonder how many kids he said similar things to that woke something up in them or maybe didn't but he was trying it out anyway by saying something to them it clearly woke up something in you so when you graduated from school did you graduate um in the way that your parents expected you to or not uh, <laughs> so it took me five years to graduate i studied abroad for um five months in the uk east midlands lincolnshire wow. Yep. Yeah, so that was, um, I was a double collegiate athlete as well. So I played basketball and tennis. Uh, and that's how I was able to fund my college degree. So I uh, went to a school that cost hmm, upwards of 40k a year. Wow. And yeah, it was it was a private liberal arts college called Baker University in Kansas. An amazing school, amazing staff. And yeah, I, I was pre med for two years. And then I had a breakdown. I got another like, F on my chemistry test, biochem. And I just, I, I asked to be excused to go to the restroom. I'm like, oh, I, I really have to go to the restroom. And I go to the restroom, I just break down crying. And I sit there for like half an hour. I'm like, I don't want to go back to class. I don't want to do this. I'm just, I'm miserable. I, I like, I, I'm literally taking on all this weight to please my mother. And it's the hardest thing for a lot of first generation uh, kids to yeah. come to terms with, like, you can live your life and still honor your parents and you can love your parents but still live your life in a way that pleases you because you know knock on wood when my mom one day passes and i've done everything to make her happy when she's no longer here i'm stuck with a life that doesn't make me happy then right. what? you know right. so i had to come to terms with the fact that like if it comes down to it pleasing my mother or myself i have to choose myself yeah however many years ahead of me, like, I've really got to give myself this shot. 
Yeah, completely. Well, a shout out to teachers because I, you know, one of my beefs has been for a long time that the Western education system is so broken. It's so one size fits all. Yeah. I now have eight grandchildren. I watch them suffering, different ones of them, yeah. with the compliance requirement of the education system here that has no interest in the individual forms of intelligence. So, you know, shout out to teachers listening to us today. And we want to say to you, teachers, it only takes one word from you to a possible glow or whoever's in your class that may wake something up in them that changes the trajectory of their lives as it did for you. So out of school, what did you do first work-wise? <laughs> a quick note to that. Uh, I think it's super important to mention that kids are so impressionable. Like yeah, yeah. the direct line of influence is their parents, their friends, and then their teachers. Sure. So, yeah, shout out to teachers because you really have an important job of like right. yeah, making a, a big impact in, in kids' lives. So after school, um, so I mentioned, I told my mom that I was no longer pre-med 10 days before graduation. So she was living in Arizona. I went to college in Kansas. So here I was at graduation, like, mm, I can't go back home because now <laughs> my mom is like so upset that I waited this long and uh. that I'm no longer going to be a doctor. So I, I literally escaped. So I booked a one-way ticket to London. Um, I had $500 in my bank account. Luckily, I landed a six-month internship at the same university that I studied abroad at. So I was there for another six months, and I adore that university, but oh my goodness, they paid me pennies to the hour. And wow. again, when you're so desperate and you're so willing to prove yourself, because it was an internship, so I, I was like, if I just work my butt off, if I'm, I'm literally gonna, I, my, my office had a couch. I would sleep in my office, like just to like pull extra shifts. Other people saw how talented I was like, oh, Glow does video, Glow does graphic design, Glow does this. And they just gave me all of their work. So like they, you know, and I was always happy to help as well. So people, other departments were passing off their work to me. So I was like not only doing my work, but other people's work. And I was so overworked and so tired, but I was abroad. I was out of the country. So right. for me, I was willing to just, man, just overwork and run myself to the ground because I'm like, if I work so hard, like they're going to see that like, oh, I'm such an asset. Like they, they're going to have to keep me and make a full-time position out of this. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> First and foremost, life never works that way. <laughs> right. I don't know if this is like an Aries tendency, but we, we tend to be a little naive or idealistic about the way people work, especially business. Mm -hmm. um, but they were going to have new administration come in. And the, the current president at the time loved me, adored me, was vouching for me to get a, a full-time position. New administration was like, how can we save more money? Who could we cut? <laughs> so he was oh. like, yeah, yeah. I'm not trying to hear it. Like we had a meeting and principal's like, look, Glow's amazing. Here's everything she's done. Here's what she's produced. Like you really got to keep her. And he was like, oh yeah, we'll consider it. But so Glow, what's your plans after this? Is there anything you'd like to do? You know, where are you going? I was like, I literally have a hundred bucks in my bank account. I've got no plan. I was banking on staying here, you know. But once I learned that, I had to have my moment, obviously to process and then move on. So I booked a $25 ticket to Barcelona, built a website overnight called the Glow Academy, which is global learning objectives. Cause I'm like, okay, if I'm gonna be in Spain, I know that I'm a native English speaker. I'm gonna use that to my advantage. So uh, how, old, how old are you at this time? I was 23, okay. 23, 22, 22, 23. 20, yeah, so you're heading to Barcelona, yeah. Yep. And then I basically just hustle. I remember walking into hostels and I'm just like, hey, here's my Instagram. Let me run yours. Like who works reception? I don't want any money. I would literally tell them up front because here's the thing. If you get someone to work for you for free, like there's no losses. You know, what? what is right. like, I wanted to make it so easy for them to say yes. Like, oh my God. Like I wanted to be such an obvious answer. Yeah. I would walk into hostels and, and tell them, let me work your reception for free. All I need is a bed. Because when you're traveling, you have, you basically have two, you know, needs, shelter and food. 
you know? So I was like, all I need is a bed. And so they're like, ah, yeah. And I'm like, I'll run your Instagram too. And I'm like, wait, Globe, don't throw in too much. They already said yes. Wow. Wow. (laughs) So I was like living out of hostels. I was like um, going to neighborhoods, rich Spanish neighborhoods, knocking knocking door to door. And I had this script memorized. Hola, soy Gloria, enseñar, enseñar tu hijos inglés. You know, I, I'm a native English speaker. I can teach your kids English. And I remember, like, the first time someone just, like, looked at me and shut the door in my face. And I think that's why I'm so relentless in my hustle now. I'm like, oh, I've been rejected in every type of way. I've been rejected in Spanish. Like, I'll be okay being rejected in English. <laughs> Did you see all of that when you were 23? Did you see all of that hustling and that um, being quick on your feet and offering to work for free because there's no downside to them? Did you see all that as entrepreneurialism? You know, and here's the thing, and I I hope this comes across the right way. When you know you're going to make it in a special way in life, nothing really gets you down because I knew that I was going to be successful. I just had no idea in what or how. I didn't know what my path was going to look like. Success is never linear. So I was like, look, whatever it takes to help me get to the next level, because no matter what, I'm developing interpersonal skills. I'm developing communication skills. I'm developing content and graphic design skills. I would walk into restaurants that I couldn't even afford to eat at just so I can tell them, oh, let me redesign your menu. Oh, this is a bad translation in Spanish. Like, let me go ahead and let me run to my hostel. I can whip this up for you, 50 euros, redesign your menu. And like, I would literally like find ways to make business on the spot. That type of savvy, you can't teach that. It comes from experience and it comes from desperation as well. And I was willing to like, I'm not going to reach out and be like, hey guys, struggling in Paris. I'm struggling in Barcelona. Like, I put myself in this situation. Let me struggle. Let me work. Let me sweat for this lifestyle because the life that I live now, like, like I know that I've like worked so hard to attain it. So I think a lot of people in this new age, the, the level of entitlement now, like, okay, I, I put in my two months of, of hustling. <laughs> like I deserve, you know, the dream life. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you got to put in the work. You can't shortcut that part. So you felt, you know, it's interesting when you said, I always knew I'd be successful. Your definition of successful or the awareness of that was more an internal awareness you had that you were developing uh, a skill set and a character and internal strengths that you knew would ultimately turn into money. My arsenal of, because there are, again, there are certain things that only come from experience and putting yourself out there and being willing to fail. And I'm like, the amount of experience I'm getting and putting myself out there, developing like businesses on the fly, pitching myself to hot, like I was pitching before I realized I was pitching, walking right. into hostels and literally pulling up my Instagram I've got 5,000 followers and here's my, here's my gallery. I can do the same for your business. Like no idea what I was doing. Wow. If I can, I, if I can do it for myself, I can, I can replicate, you know, the same system and process in, in another business. So not before there was even language for what I was doing, I was doing it. Wow. <laughs> so did you get work in that area of uh, building websites and social media customers? Uh, I mean, I was doing anything and everything. I was building websites. I was doing social media management. I was doing graphic design. I remember there was even a couple on Instagram. They hired me to do their engagement photos in Barcelona. Like, I literally was like, Jack, I called it Jack Keisha of all trades, <laughs> a play on words. <laughs> but I, I would do it all. And I think now having the flexibility and the luxury to kind of niche down and say, okay, I no longer have to do it all. I want to do X, Y, Z, but I no longer have to. And that's such a luxury. And what was your next phase after that? So you're in Barcelona, you're in your mid twenties. Are you there for a while? I actually, it took me a month and a half before I get signed to play semi-pro basketball. Oh, wow. Wow. Now I have a residency permit. Now I have a salary and I'm like, whoa, like I made it. I got it. Like life is good because technically Schengen zone, you can't overstay 90 days. Mm -hmm. So getting the residency permit allowed me to be legal. 
And being on the basketball team allowed me to have a bit of a salary. It wasn't much, but it was something uh, steady. And <laughs> oh, I don't know if this is like, <laughs> it's funny to think back on this. So season lasts about six to seven months. We're practicing three to four times a week, traveling every weekend for games. All of a sudden, that freedom element is taken out. And I'm like, okay, I have the salary. I have the, the legal paperwork. I no longer have the freedom to dictate how I want to live my life, where I get to travel, what I get to do, how I get to build content. And I was like, man, I realized freedom, the hierarchy of needs for me, freedom is at the very top. And I was like, you can give me a salary. I will switch it for freedom. I want the freedom to make money the way on my terms, you know? Yeah. Basketball is such a passion. I love basketball. I grew up playing it. It was my very first sport. Um, so blessed to have it have been an escape in my life. But I realized it's not something I want to do professionally. And, you know, yeah, getting to that point, having that really hard conversation with my coach, like I appreciate everything he did for me this season. They literally took money out of other players' salary to accommodate mine. And I felt so bad. I was like, well, like, I didn't know what it took to get me there. And when they're sharing that story, I'm like, oh, ultimate guilt trip, you know, because here I am about to tell them that I don't want to renew my contract. And I might have told a white lie and said that I was, you know, needing to go back to the U.S. <laughs> um, but I ended up booking a one-way ticket to Paris. And I was like, all right, more content. Like, let's, I kind of just left Barcelona from there. And I was like, okay, I need to create content. Like the way, as a travel blogger, the way to stand out is to build up a portfolio of content in multiple countries. And I'm like, I can't only talk about Barcelona. Like, let me explore more of Europe. Let me go further east. Because when you're hitting the Bulgarias, the Romanias, the huh. Albanias, that's where it's like, whoa, what's a black girl doing in Albania? Like, that's, right. that's yeah. really good content. <laughs> At what point did you realized that you felt you were um you kind of hitting a sweet spot in terms of the the, the alignment of your entrepreneurial ability mm. and it becoming a real income stream now was that in the travel area definitely so the very first time a brand offered because i was still super ignorant to how it worked because it being an influencer there wasn't language for that yet so back in 2014 2015 it was still kind of like, you know, brands worked with bloggers, but it, as an influencer, that wasn't really a thing. So I was okay with free flights because again, for me, I was like, if, if, I, if they can fly me to different countries, I can create my own content. And I mean, out of 81 countries, I would say probably 47 were on the dime of sponsors. So that was really helpful for me in building up that portfolio. And it was really great. And I think when it got to like the, 12th or 15th country I was like these free flights are great <laughs> but <laughs> not paying my phone bill they're not you know getting me food at restaurants I, I've got to find a way to figure out how to put it into my pitch or ask for it and not feel like I'm being demanding because again right. when we think about entitlement these days it's so hard to to draw the line between okay this is my worth this is what I feel um, makes sense. And then here's also gratitude for everything you're offering because you flying me on a $3,000 round trip flight to Vietnam, I mean, I wouldn't be able to afford that. So I had to be like, okay, I am so grateful. This opportunity to travel to all these beautiful places that I never would be able to afford, but I can't just travel there for free. I've got, if I'm creating content for your, your company, and I'm, I'm writing for your company. I, I need money, you know? And those conversations are as awkward as they sound. Because again, you will be gaslighted. The very first time a brand came back at me, it was like, oh, wow, like a blogger would never ask for that. We would never pay a blogger that. We don't have a budget. Okay, wow. if, you, if you don't want it, you know, we, we can't offer anything above this. And they would really, very wow. negative. They would make you feel like, how dare you ask for more? You know, and again, I'm aware of the times that, you know, I was in where it just wasn't as normal. And what a lot of travel bloggers don't actually share is that many of them 
when they started building their travel blog, like their, their partners, their spouses were helping support their, their journey. So it was a lot right. easier for them to be traveling to these exotic places. And so my audience knew I was single. My audience knew ain't no sugar daddy over here. Like <laughs> glow right. is grinding, you know? So mm -hmm. it, was, it was such a humbling uh, period, but I would definitely say eventually I got to a point where my work spoke for itself. You know, I was getting reposted and republished and syndicated in different online publications to the point where people like knew that if they were pitching me, it had to come with a price tag. <laughs> so the, the, the travel journalism or the travel blogging, as you call it, was the first main um, business that you created, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, and what did you, because you have several businesses now, what did you evolve into beyond that? Yeah, well, so just taking a, a small step back. So Glowtography mm -hmm. was my first, I, I guess, official business in college. Okay. My Instagram handle is called Glow Graphics because Glow yes. Graphics Designs was my second business. So the blog abroad was actually my third, I guess, entrepreneurial business. Um, but having graphic design and photography just in my arsenal is great because I know what it takes to create content, to, to, to be relevant to storytell, digital storytelling. Um, so after travel blogging, um, I would say being a travel host, like there were different brands that would pay me to do like on camera, um, whether it's like, it's, I don't want to call it like commercial work, but it was like, yeah, I, I guess it was commercial work. Like I would shoot like small ads for the country, for the tourism board there. I was being hired at one point for my Snapchat account. Snapchat was really big in 2016. Um, and a tourism board, they paid me like $3,000 just to Snapchat while I was in a city for a week. Mm -hmm. So it, it was really interesting. I was like, whoa. And once you start getting those pitches of like, oh, I'm worth this, you start raising your, your value. You're like, okay, this brand is paying me this for that. I can probably pitch this for that, you know. And you start kind of understanding um, context and, and what you're pretty much worth. So, um you know, we, we came into each other's worlds quite recently, but I understand then that quite recent for you, you did a post that went viral. What was that post? Um, so are we talking about the, is it rude to call us black post? Is that, what, is that the one that, you know, gained you all those followers in a short time? Well, it was interesting because the first week of post, I mean, all of them were getting like half a million impressions. The very first one that got 4 million impressions was, is it rude to call us black? So that one got 4 million impressions. The rest of them got half a million impressions. So they all kind of like took off in the first week. But you've been posting stuff around that subject for a while, right? Yeah. So I definitely like the first time I, I want to say it was five or six years ago. The first time I talked about being spit at, you know, while I was just walking, this was in Prague, Czech Republic, um, the, the, the amount of times I get mistaken for a prostitute. Um, yeah, just kind of like the layers of my identity as a black single woman. It's like I'm first seen as an African immigrant, sorry, an, an African prostitute, then a local prostitute, then an immigrant, then wow. a tourist. It's like the layers. Once I open my mouth and they hear my my American accent, oh, 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 she's got money. Then they see, wow. the, they no longer see the black skin, they see the green money. It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Man, it's like, you don't, you don't even want to eat there anymore, you know? Why did that, why did that post have that response? Do you know, why did it go viral? Yeah, you know, I, I think again, when so many people, I don't want to say ignore, well, I mean, it, it could be ignore, erasure, the black experience, it's never talked about, it's not mainstream. It's like, suck it up, you're no longer slaves. Like, why are you still complaining or talking about it? So I would share these stories on my blog and I would still get those comments of like, oh my gosh, get over it. It's been so many years. None of my parents own slaves. And I'm like, it's so nuanced. The conversation, it's like, it's not just about slavery. Like being black is not just about slavery. Like this, the black experience, like it, it's so complex. And here are some of the conversations that we have in our community about what we have to deal with, what we have to stomach, you know, and what we have to, yeah, put up with, you know, and you have to almost choose your battles because the daily microaggressions, you'll drive yourself crazy, like fighting every single one. 
Thank you for taking the time to listen to Paul Scanlon's podcast channel. We just wanted to remind you about the free course that's available to you on the five behaviors of successful people. So go and head over to paulscanlon.com forward slash free course to sign up for that today. And please do subscribe, share and review this podcast channel.